Well, hearty good evening to everyone. Welcome. Today is uh, Monday, April 18th, and this is your City of Sioux Falls City Council meeting. I'd like to welcome everybody. Uh, we'll start with a roll call to identify which city councilors are here tonight. Councilors Aguilar? Here. Anderson? Here. Brown? Here. Intamin? Here. Erpenbach? Here. Jameson? Karski? Here. Rolfing? We do have six city councilors in here tonight. That is enough to do your business. Uh, we would like to start with uh, an invocation. Uh, we're incredibly pleased to have uh, Councilor Brown here tonight, and Councilor Brown will lead us in prayer. After that's completed, what we'd like you to do is to remain standing, and we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Councilor Vernon Brown. If you'd please rise. Dear God, we know that we live in a city of great blessings. Still, help us be mindful always of those in the community who struggle. Let us come to the table tonight with a sense of compromise and a thought for solutions, even when those tough solutions come with difficult decisions. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, Again, hearty good evening to everyone tonight. Uh, would like Pam Bullinger, Bob O'Connell, Brenda Kibbe, and Renee Grayson uh, to come forward, please. I do have a proclamation on behalf of the citizens of Sioux Falls that I'd like uh, to read to you. Whereas Volunteers of America Dakotas is celebrating 90 years of service this year in the Sioux Falls community. Whereas Volunteers of America started in 1920 providing prison ministries, and in 1923 began providing child care centers to serve families during World War I. Whereas Volunteers of America's, America Dakotas is recognized as one of the longest running nonprofit child care in agencies in the nation. Whereas the ninth annual Partners Breakfast will be held on May 5, 2011 to thank all of its partners and to share its success and goals with all of our partners and to keep fulfilling the human service needs in the Dakotas by helping people help themselves and fulfill their hopes and dreams for a brighter future. Whereas in 2011, Volunteers of America Dakotas has six service areas, children, youth and families, mental health, employment, training and disability, housing and homelessness, community enhancement and substance abuse and prevention. 508 professionally trained employees, part-time and full-time, and over 1,100 volunteers. Whereas in fiscal year 2010, Volunteers of America Dakota served over 35,370 children, youth, adults, and families from throughout the Dakotas. Whereas Volunteers of America Dakota's mission as a nonprofit spiritually based organization is to reach out to empower people of all ages to become healthier, self-sufficient, productive members of their communities. Now, therefore, I, Mike Huther, Mayor of the City of Sioux Falls, do hereby proclaim May 5th, 2011, as Volunteers of America Dakota's Day in Sioux Falls. Mr. Mayor, members of Council, Bob O'Connell, it's my privilege this year to be the chair uh, the Volunteers of America Dakotas and probably the most exciting year that we've ever had. First of all, I'd like to introduce some of the f folks we have here. Vicki Hurd is, is our intern and she uh, comes from about fi five hours north of London, England. And uh, Pam Bollinger is our hardworking CEO and president. And Renee Grayson is our development specialist, better known as our fundraiser. Anyway, we're grateful here to have the proclamation that you've given us tonight uh, for our, our annual uh, breakfast, partners breakfast at 7.30 on the 5th of May. 
very important for us this year, especially because of the cuts we've received from Medicare, and Medicaid, etc. And we really hope that all of the council folks and the mayor can, can be there. It's also a special year for another reason. On June 11th through the 14th this year, for the first time, the Volunteers of America National Meeting will not be held in Chicago or New York or Seattle or any of those places but it'll be held here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And we're really proud of that and really looking forward to showing off our city. We're going to have a special meeting down at the Falls Park, and we're going to have a light show and fireworks, and we're looking forward to approximately 500 folks from all over the country who will be coming here to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and we're very proud of that. And also, we want to thank, finally, the city for its help on the Bollinger and Center right here in the middle of the city, Pettigrew, and we bust some kids in. And uh, thank you for helping us work with police on family intervention. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thanks again, Bob. Appreciate it. Um, now I'd like to start with uh, tonight's meeting uh, with approval of tonight's consent uh, agenda. Can I have a motion to approve? Move to approve, Entman. Second, Karski. Councilor Entman has made a motion to approve tonight's consent agenda. It was seconded by Councilor Karski. Any discussion? Hearing none, a vote, please. Councilor Karski? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Entman? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. That is passed 6 0. Thank you. Uh, City Council, would anybody like to make a motion to approve tonight's regular agenda? So moved, Erpenbach. Second, Anderson. It's been a motion by Councilor Erpenbach, seconded by Councilor Anderson, Jr., to approve tonight's regular agenda. Any further discussion? A roll call vote, please. Councilor Skarsky? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Intamin? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. That has also passed 6 to 0. Thank you very much. I'd like to welcome all of you to tonight's City Council meeting. We're certainly pleased to have you here. Really nice crowd once again. This is an opportunity for any public input uh, on uh, items that are here tonight. What we'd ask is that if there's an item that is on the regular agenda, if you would like to speak to that item, we would ask that you wait until that particular um, uh, meeting point. For example, uh, there's an opportunity to talk about rates uh, tonight. We'd ask you to wait until that particular item. There's another opportunity to talk about uh, potentially naming rights. If you're here to talk about that, uh, then we'd ask you to, to wait for that particular item. However, if there's another topic that's not on the regular agenda and you'd like to speak to your city council, we'd ask you to come forward right now. Uh, please just leave it to five minutes and just introduce yourself. Welcome. Mr. Tim, please welcome. How are we doing today? My name is Tim Stanga. Um, I just want to let everybody know that uh, I'm working for the people that are outside this building, not anybody else. First meeting I came from uh, was a four o'clock meeting. We talked about uh, how we're going to look at uh, uh, investing money and coming up with money for the uh, event center. Stayed for the city council meeting with the county commission. And then we're talking about homeless people, homeless children, and poverty. Now, what part don't we understand? We're talking about a $100,000, $100 million loan for an event center. And then we come out and talk about poverty, um, children that are homeless. And I just don't quite understand where we're at in this city. I mean, uh, it's just frustrating. And I know it's frustrating for a lot of people that are sitting outside this building. We got a 3.5, from what I understand, million dollars in a cookie jar. Where we have people that are lucky if they got lint in their cookie jar left. You know, we could put money 
we could go ahead and fix every single road in Sioux Falls. And I'll tell you something, you got to get out and drive because it isn't just one or two roads, it's every road that needs to be fixed. We could take half of that money and put it towards sewer. And we'll talk about that later on, I guess. I just, I don't know where we're sitting at. Um, they say that uh, we're not going to anticipate any uh, on, on raising taxes. Anticipate is where I sort of sort of leave that a little bit long there because when you use that word, normally your taxes are going to go up. Second penny sales tax was brought up for uh, funding of the entertainment center. Second penny sales tax is supposed to be used for roads and infrastructure and I would be appreciative if that's what you guys use it for from now on. I am not going to use my money that should be used on our roads and infrastructure on an entertainment center. We look at uh, um, entertainment tax. How many entities are taken from the entertainment tax already? And how many more can take from it? I uh, am pretty much fed up with what's going on, how things are being done, and I know a lot of people outside this building are. Mr. Stanley, thank you. I know you don't want to hear it, Mayor, but again, we have, we're talking about operational budgets for one building. Mr. Stanley, we're going to have two. Thank you, Mr. Stanley. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak to the City Council? Welcome. Good evening. My name is uh, Andy Traub. This is Samuel. Um, just a couple of things that are not on the agenda at all, and actually they're related to snow, which I thought was going to be in our past, but it's not. Uh, first, I would love uh, an update at some point on any decisions we made with snow gates. I don't know if I missed it or not, but I was blessed abundantly by those this winter and um, thought they were a great investment, at least for my driveway. So uh, more updates on that would be great. And the second is... Um, um, I know that we have purchased a lot of new chemicals or some different kind of chemicals for our roads and I would love to see what happened with that. I know that was sort of a, a new option. Um, and then the last thing is uh, I'm really, uh, it's more just a word of encouragement to the council. I feel like um, there's been uh, a lot more acknowledgement of the group that I'm a part of or Build It Downtown and, and we appreciate that. And, um, you know, I turn on television news and it's just, it's just not news. It's just fighting and yelling and there's no real dialogue, and um, I, I'm encouraged by what I see as more of an attempt uh, by you, Mr. Mayor, and also just by the council of, of just having more dialogue. And um, nobody needs to rush to spend that much money. Um, and so I'm just encouraged by the dialogue and hope we can continue to have it and be civil about it. I, I really believe that all of you want the best thing for our city. And um, uh, as Mr. Sanger was saying, that's a, a ridiculous amount of money to spend, and it's a lot of responsibility for us to have. Um, but I just hope that we would never um, shy away from that dialogue and that um, I think the worst thing you could all do politically is is uh, to stick with what you've done in the past because that's what you decided on. So whether it means change your mind publicly, uh, that's I would encourage you to do that if you feel like that's where your heart's being led to do. Um, but I just want to let you know that there are people that think you're doing a good job and uh, keep up the, the dialogue, please. We get concerned when we don't get updates and we don't um, have all the numbers. So just please continue to be transparent and um, bring those up to the public. Thanks. Andy, thank you very much. And again, we will be giving an update on the snow gates as well as those new chemicals. Uh, we really appreciate it. Folks, anybody else, we, we certainly want to allow you the opportunity to speak to the council, uh, whether you're positive or not so positive. It is your opportunity. Well, very good. We, we do thank you for being here tonight. We do. Let's continue on with the, uh, tonight's uh, business. Uh, we'll move on to item number three. New 2010-11 Retail Malt Beverage License for Benito Guadalajara Incorporated, Benito Guadalajara Mexican Restaurant to be operated at 1010 North Minnesota Avenue, full service restaurant, CUP not required. 
Item 4, new 2011 retail wine license for Benito Guadalajara Incorporated, Benito Guadalajara Mexican Restaurant to be operated at 1010 North Minnesota Avenue, full service restaurant, CUP not required. Item 5, transfer of a 2011 retail liquor license from Sioux Falls Ventures LLC, Boston's The Gourmet Pizza, 3202 East 10th Street to Overtime Incorporated, Overtime Sports Grill and Bar to be operated at 4529 East 26th Street, including video lottery terminals. Full service restaurant, CUP not required. Item 6, rescind 2010-11 retail malt beverage license issued to Overtime Incorporated, Overtime Sports Grill and Bar, 4529 East 26th Street. Item 7, rescind 2011 retail wine license issued to Overtime Incorporated, Overtime Sports Grill and Bar, 4529 East 26th Street. Item 8, Transfer of a 2011 package liquor license from Selmata Mini Mart LLC, Selmata Mini Mart 812 East 10th Street to Alamaz, Fisha, and Amari Wall, Walia Convenience Store to be operated at 812 East 10th Street. Item 9. Transfer of a 2010-11 retail malt beverage license from Jan Wood Falls Overlook Cafe 825 North Weber Avenue to Utopia LLC Falls Overlook Cafe to be operated at 825 North Weber Avenue. Full service restaurant, CUP not required. Item 10, transfer of a 2011 retail wine license from Jan Wood Falls Overlook Cafe 825 North Weber Avenue to Utopia LLC Falls Overlook Cafe to be operated at 825 North Weber Avenue. Full service restaurant, CUP not required. Item 11, transfer of a 2011 packaged liquor license from I-90 Fuel Services Incorporated, JJ's Wine, Spirits and Cigars, 4810 Southwestern Avenue to T-Slat, Inc., JJ's Wine, Spirits and Cigars to be operated at 4810 Southwestern Avenue. Item 12, special one-day liquor license for Philanthropy Promotions, Inc., J&L Harley-Davidson for Hot Harley Nights on July 9th, 2011, and then tent, tent area at Falls Park West, Park Area North of the Sioux Falls Park and Recreation Office leading to Falls Park along Phillips Avenue with the north boundary of Falls Park Drive, south boundary to 8th Street, east boundary is to the chain link fence on the east side of the park. The street will be closed on 6th Street from Dakota to Weber Avenues in the west boundary of Dakota Avenue. Item 13, special one day liquor license request for Great Bear Recreation Park Incorporated Great Bear Recreation Park to be operated at 5901 East Rice Street for wedding receptions on April 29th, July 16th, and August 27th, 2011. Item 14, special one-day liquor license for the Sanford Health Foundation to be held at the Sanford Center, 2301 East 60th Street North for the 2011 Sanford Children's Gala on August 20th, 2011. <coughs> Item 15, Special one-day liquor license request for hy Incorporated, all occasions by hy to be operated at the Delbridge Museum of Natural History, 805 South Kiwanis Avenue, for wedding receptions on the following dates, June 18th and 25th, July 2nd, August 6th, 20th and 27th, September 3rd, 10th, 17th and 24th, and October 8th, 2011. Item 16, special one-day malt beverage and special one-day wine licenses for the Sioux Falls Area Community Foundation to be held at the Avera Cancer Institute, 1000 East 23rd Street, for SFACF fundraising event on May 5, 2011. Item 17, special one-day malt beverage and special one-day wine licenses for the Make-A-Wish Foundation of South Dakota to be operated at the 8th and Railroad Center, 401 East 8th Street, on the east side of the center, including the parking area for a fundraising event on September 17, 2011. Item 18. Special one-day malt beverage and special one-day wine license requests for downtown Sioux Falls for the downtown block party at the East Bank at the 8th and Railroad parking lot, 401 East 8th Street on June 3rd, July 1st, and August 5th, 2011, and hot summer nights on Phillips Avenue from 9th to 14th Street, Main Avenue from 10th to 13th Streets, 12th Street from Main to Phillips Avenues, 11th Street from Dakota to Mall Avenues, and 10th Street from Main to Mall Avenues on July 13, 2011. Item 19, special one-day malt beverage and special one-day wine licenses for the L. Ride Shriners L. Ride Moss to be operated on Main Avenue from 10th to 13th Streets, Phillips Avenue from 9th to 14th Streets, 1st Avenue from 11th to 13th Streets, 
10th Street from Main to Mall Avenues, 11th Street from Dakota to Mall Avenues, 12th Street from Main to 1st Avenues, and 13th Street from Dakota to 1st Avenues for Automania on June 24, 2011. Item 20, special one-day wine license for the American Civil Liberties Union to be operated at the Old Courthouse Museum, 200 West 6th Street, for a fundraiser on April 22, 2011. Lori, welcome. Thank you. Lori Hogstead with the City Attorney's Office here for items 3 through 20. Um, as Denise read, items 3 and 4 are for a new business. We then have items 5 through 11, which are transfers of ownership and or locations. And then we have the remaining items 12 through 20 are nine special one-day licenses, an indication that the weather will be getting better. <laughs> so outdoor events. I can answer questions on any of these items. City Council, are there any questions or, or Lori, do you know, is there anyone in the audience who'd like to speak to the Council about any of these topics? Not specifically that I'm aware of. Is there anyone in the audience who'd like to speak uh, to any of these items before uh, there's a motion that's made? Very good. Councilor Aguilar. Mr. Mayor, I move that we approve items 3 through 11 and 13 through 20. There has been a motion to approve items 3 through 11 and items 13 through 20. Are there any further discussions? Or, or, can I have a second on that, please? Second, Brown. Thank you, Councilor Brown, for seconding that. Uh, is there any further comments or questions on that? Very good. If we could have a roll call vote, please. Councilors Karski? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Intamin? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. That has passed six to zero. Would somebody like to make another motion? Mr. Mayor, I need to excuse myself. Councilor Anderson, thank you very much. Brown moves to approve item number 12. Second, Erpenbach. Councilor Brown's made a motion to approve item number 12. It was seconded by Councilor Erpenbach. Is there any further discussion? Can we have a motion to approve? Or can we have a vote, please? Councilors Karski? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. That has passed five to zero. Thank you. Item 21. Deferred from the meeting on December 6, 2010, January 3rd, 2011, and February 14, 2011, a second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property at 412 East 12th Street from the C3 Central Business District to sub-area E of the Beetle Greenway Plan Development District, petition number 2010-09-02, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Mr. Cooper, welcome. Good evening. I'm Mike Cooper with Planning and Building Services. This is a petition that we have seen in the past uh, from Ronning companies, and this petition asked for a consideration to rezone the River Terrace Apartments from the Central Business District to the uh, Beetle Greenway Plan Development District. This particular property is located along East 12th Street and South 3rd Avenue, and it consists of approximately 88 units of rental housing. We began looking at this back in December of last year, and uh, I'd like to turn this over to City Attorney David Fifley for uh, some recommendations to the council. And we do have a representative here tonight uh, for the petitioner. Thank you. Mr. Fifley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as the council may be aware, this property is involved in some litigation involving the uh, downtown business improvement district. Uh, we've been having some discussions regarding settlement of that litigation. Unfortunately, they haven't resolved the matter yet. However, we've had some very promising discussions in the last couple days, and we would, uh, on behalf of the city attorney's office and our outside counsel who's representing us, I would request that we postpone this matter to a date certain, which would be June 20th of 2011 at that regular council meeting at that time. Uh, we hope that this continued time would allow the parties to continue their settlement discussions. And our attorney told the uh, Ronning attorney today that we would be making this request. So we appreciate your consideration. Before we have a motion, I think it would be prudent of me to ask if there's anybody in the audience who'd like to speak to the council while they're here tonight. Welcome, Ms. Point. Uh, thank you. Chuck Point with Ronning Companies, 4401E6, Sioux Falls. Um, small, minor detail, it's, uh, the apartments are 84 units, uh, uh, just short of 88, but that's, that's uh, really not important. We didn't know um, 
when I left my house today at uh, quarter two that the city attorney would be recommending a deferral. Um, but in any event, uh, Slate Ronning is curious why. And what we're curious about is really, we've really been mystified by this long, long deferral of a request to rezone the use, the, the zoning of these apartments to what their actual use is. And it's the same zoning as the buildings just across the street to the south and the east, 10 of them, which, as Attorney Fifely mentions, are also part of the downtown BID. So we don't understand. We hope that one of you would ask him why. We don't understand. We respectfully ask these questions. We truly don't understand. And as far as we know, the city has never before in the past refused the petition of a property owner to rezone a property to its current use. In addition to that, this application has been through the hearing process um, at the City Planning Commission, received their unanimous approval, and was reviewed positively by the planning staff. So again, we hope that one of you would ask the city attorney why. Thank you. Ms. Brown, thank you. I, I don't think we have to wait for someone to ask why. I think it was a direct question, Ms. Point and Ms. Fifley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, the, one of the arguments made in that litigation uh, re, is regarding the zoning of the properties in question. If this uh, zoning is changed, it could impact that litigation. We're just requesting that the zoning that has been in place for approximately 20 years for this property remain so for another 60 days so that we can allow that litigation to hopefully re be resolved. Very good. Is there anyone else in the audience who'd like to speak to this item? Very good. City Council, would anybody like to uh, make a motion or have some action on this item? Mr. Mayor, I move that we uh, postpone this for consideration on the June 20th meeting upon recommendation of our city attorney. There is a, there has been a motion made by Councilor Entman to defer item number 21 to June 20th, 2011. It was seconded by Councilor Karski. Is there any discussion on this item? Hearing none, if we could have a, a roll call vote, please. Councilor Skarski? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Intamin? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. That is passed 6 to 0. Item 22. Second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the revised ordinances of the city, revising sewer utility rates and charges as found in Chapter 41 Utilities. Rate changes effective July 1, 2011. Ms. Conner, welcome. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Um, tonight with me, we have our rate uh, review consultants with us, Steve Burian with A2S, as well as Nicole Joby. We also have several key staff from Public Works that are here to answer your questions. One of the things we'd like to do is to build on the questions that were asked of us at the first reading and take you through um, uh, our responses. And then, of course, um, myself, Steve, and the other members of our staff will do our best to answer your questions. First and foremost, protecting the health of the community and the environment is really the key mission of what a water reclamation a division does in any community across the country. One of the things that we've always done um, of recent is we've had a very comprehensive capital plan and we were at a very close point where we were going to be only at inflationary increases going forward. One of the questions that's been asked is how do we fund these large capital improvement projects today? And as you, um, 
as most of you know, but maybe not every member of the community, that we use a, a funding source through the state, which is the State Revolving Fund. They are low interest loans. Tonight, later, there'll be a, an additional loan that's asked for. Um, the interest rate is about 1.25% for a 10 year term. But there was a history with this that there was a part in our history where um, these large capital projects were not funded all by ratepayers. In 1972, when Congress enacted the Clean Water Act and asked, um, required communities to clean up their wastewater and responsibly discharge it to the rivers and streams, they actually had a program that 75% of those project costs were grant dollars to the federal government, 25% were local. Our plant in Sioux Falls qualified for that. So that was a significant capital project of not too recent past um, in the mid-80s that actually qualified for that project. Going forward, um, those types of grants do not exist, and we have to fund our replacement uh, projects with user fees, um, which we're very fortunate that there's an SRF program at the state um, that allows us to do that. I think um, certainly I remember, and I assume uh, many of you do, we all know what took place in 2010 on the impacted homes and the discharges that we've had to the environment with the wastewater. The rate, the rate increase um, that we are bringing forward to you tonight, which is this item and the next, is really a key step in strengthening the system. It's a result of assessing the system. We prioritized the projects, and again, about 70% of those projects were in our comprehensive capital plan. Um, we just felt it a pressing need to accelerate those and rehabilitate those sewers. The next, the next step was to develop the funding strategies to fund those capital improvements, and that's why we're here. We've accelerated the central main projects, and both of those are under construction. Later tonight, you'll see the next large sanitary sewer project that will really provide the relief to the lower end of Sioux Falls uh, down by the uh, south side of the 229 area. Um, and the reason we brought this mid-year rate increase is we believed it was a lot smoother effect on our rate payers as opposed to doing two years of 12 and 13 with double-digit rate increases. We had some questions come up about the uh, reserves and the amount of the reserves. And so we just wanted to give you a basis of the operating reserve is essentially we have in place cash to be able to operate for at least a 90-day period. And so we take our operating budget, which is the operation alone is about an $8 million budget per year, and about $2 million of that we target to actually have in the bank so we can actually operate the utility through the year. Uh, this covers us from a float standpoint, offsets from any projections that our model may have either um, under-projected if we, if we bid our chemicals and our chemicals come in higher, if the fuel goes up, as we're starting to see today, um, if electrical costs also, if we use more than we projected or if electrical costs are higher than what we projected. And then on the other side, if meter growth doesn't materialize what our projections were, that operating reserve is that uh, gap of, that allows us to go through an entire calendar year and then reset at the next one. The second reserve is called a capital reserve. And this is one where we think it's important to take a look at our capital plan and we set aside or we target to have about 15% of that capital plan in the bank so we, as we have smaller projects, um, and in this utility, a smaller project is somewhere in that one to, to two million dollar range. We like to fund them with cash as opposed to going to the debt market and borrowing more dollars. And so that's a key part of that. It also helps us um, if something occurs like it did last summer, that's our, that's our emergency fund that allows us to react quickly and make the repairs. We had questions that have come up as why do we hire experts? And um, Steve will be here to uh, address this as well. But I did send you a memo this week um, at a request, and I just wanted to show, show the magnitude. Over the course of the last four years, we have paid uh, AE2S for the Water Reclamation Fund about $118,000 total over those four years. Um, to make sure that we had the revenue adequacy um, for this fund, and the operational and capital dollars for that fund over that same period is <coughs> just over 95 million. So uh, it's about one, 
tenth of one percent to make sure that we have a good, very independent view, but also he has the expertise and the resources to do these detailed and complex models. Conversely, for the water, it's a larger operational and capital fund, especially with Lewis and Clark. Um, for that same period, we've paid their firm about $186,000, 300 uh, to ensure that we have the revenue adequacy to cover the operational and capital budget for that division, which is just over $206 million for that same period of time. Again, about one-tenth of one percent to make sure that we have a very solid model and the, the customer classes that we charge are paying the respective uh, right charge. We just have a few slides and then um, we can expound on that. One of the areas is that you asked us, and I believe it was Councilor Roffing, and he's not here tonight, but you asked us to look at is there some additional um, cities that are a little bit larger than the ones that were shown that you could show us on the benchmark, and I realize this is uh, difficult to see. There are a few at the door um, for members of the, of the audience. But starting from second from the top, a couple of additions are Lincoln, Boise, Idaho, Springfield, Missouri, Aurora, Colorado, Cedar Rapids, Columbia, Missouri, Omaha, Nebraska. I think this is a good point because one of the areas, Omaha is obviously uh, larger than Sioux Falls and sometimes it's one of our benchmark communities on policy. But I think uh, maybe at this point it's a good time for, um, from a regional perspective, what's happening with Omaha's rates. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up Steve Burian. Steve. Thanks, Mark. Mayor Huther, members of the council. Addressing Omaha specifically, <clears throat> in terms of the presentation this evening, as the questions arose throughout the community, um, Trent Lubers and I and our respective staff did quite a bit of work in preparing. And one of the things that we came across in looking at Omaha, although Omaha is shown on here in 2011 rates as being somewhere around probably the, the 30 percent and 40 percentile, they are facing some very major improvements and we just wanted to outline those quickly for you. Given the different stress that they have on their water reclamation utility, Omaha is facing $1.67 billion in capital improvements through over a 15 year period starting in 2010. And that, that's regarding their, their treatment plant as well as their collection system. And if we look at what that means in terms of increases, beyond what's shown on the, on the slide today, in the foreseeable future, and these are approved input in, increases, they actually do them in blocks rather than just one year at a time. They're planning to raise their rates in 2012 by 28%, in 2013 by 25%, and in 2014 by 25% again. <clears throat> and one of the things we pointed out at the last presentation was the ratio between fixed costs and, and variable costs, or the ones you have to pay whether you use water or not, and the volumetric ones. And you can see that on the slide here that Omaha actually has a a fixed rate that exceeds 50% of the overall cost for a typical user. And if we look at that minimum, <clears throat> that minimum is projected to go up to $23.45 by 2014, whether someone in Omaha uses any water or not. And so just by, for direct comparison of somebody that should have a greater economy scale in Sioux Falls on the same corridor within the country, it, what we're doing in Sioux Falls is not unprecedented. Thank you, Steve. And then just a few additions that as you go down below Sioux Falls, Pueblo, Colorado, Green Bay, Wisconsin, Des Moines, Iowa, and Fort Collins. Those are some additional cities that we added to this benchmark list um, for your review. Next slide, please. All right, the next two slides um, you've seen before, and this was as a result of the assessment. As we camered the lines and we, we took a look and graded them, not only by age, but structural uh, need. The green sewers are essentially uh, less than 20 years old. The yellows are between 20 and 30 years. The orange, red, and purple are um, in those successive decades as you move out. One of the things that we've looked at, the large red sewer, that's the central main, and that work is already underway. Um, that work is split up into two contractors and both working um, forward to those project completions. If you go to the next slide, and I, what I want you to do is just focus more on the colors. If you go to the next slide, many of those yellow sewers that were beginning in that 20 to 30 year age, 
that we identified that it was a concrete pipe that the liner was starting to fail and one of the um, one of the challenges is is to guess the, la the life of that asset once the liner starts to fail and the sewer gases start to work on those pipes. Um, so what I wanted to just show, show with you graphically is there's been a number of activities taking place since, since August. We've assessed the system. We've prioritized the projects. In some cases, we've designed them because they're already in our plan and accelerated them and bid them. And the next step is to actually work through that next tier, um, which is critical on the south side, uh, moving west from Tuthill Lift Station. Next slide, please. Uh, the next slide is just a graphical representation that we wanted to show that this, this utility is very well run. Um, the operating dollars, which are shown in blue, are essentially f um, fairly flat over that time period. And so the rate, re the rate revenue that's been taken in over the last four years since we've had very uh, aggressive increases, um, that's not going into the operation. It's going into the red and the orange, which that is the capital plan and the debt service on building out the infrastructure. And so today I just wanted to share with you that um, these rate increases, um, we're investing that into the system, not growing the operation side of the utility. And then last, there is a couple of graphs, and I apologize for this, but um, the next one is potentially a little bit easier to follow, but one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to look back to 1990. And if you um, had a, uh, that is the cost of your water bill back to 1990 if you used about 5,310 gallons. It's about $9.70 in 1990. We essentially, if you look across the bottom, and there's that red line that in 1994 there was a there was a there was a spike in that line. That's where there was an increase in rates. Then the next time was in 1999, and the next time was in 2001. The line, as you move then a little bit toward the left, and you start to see that um, that peak factor, that is the rate increases that we've. Uh, recommended since 2006. The black line is the rate of inflation. And that's fluctuated, but it stayed somewhat constant in that 3.5 to 4 percent range. Now the next slide, um, same background data, just graphed a little different. Um, what, we did, what we did here was we did cumulative inflation, which is the black line. And so you can see over the last, since 1990, through 2011, we've had very, uh, in most cases except for in 2008, we've had progressive increases in inflation. And, th and those utilities are very heavy dependent on electricity, chemicals, um, and equipment to make sure that we can maintain the system on top of the staff that uh, works there. Well, the, the bottom red, that's the cumulative factor of the rate increases that have occurred. And I think the key here is, is to look at the gap between the rate increases and inflation. Inflation was happening progressively over um, those nearly two decades where very minimal to marginal rate increases uh, were put in place. And that's why today we have a, a fairly aggressive capital plan to make sure we can replace these aging sewers um, and so there's two sides of that coin. If we, if we look at that original um, benchmarking slide, you know, we've been very fortunate to be on the very low end of that benchmarking slide for a couple of decades. And I would tell you that from a rate payer's perspective, that can be looked at two ways. We, that we can have very low rates for a period of time until there's a point in time where we actually have to reinvest in the system, and that's where we're moving to. Um, my personal opinion is that I really, let's go back to the first slide, very first slide. My personal opinion is that we really should be in that 40 to 50 percent range. Then we're not on the high side of rates, but we're not on the extremely low side, and we're funding that utility at a responsible and healthy rate. At that point, um, Steve, anything further before we ask for questions? Um, Mayor, at this point, if you have any questions, City Council will do our best to answer them. Mr. Carter, thank you very much. 
this is a second reading, and this does give the people of Sioux Falls an opportunity to speak to the council. Uh, so if there's anyone in the audience who'd like to speak to the council, we would urge you to come up uh, at this point in time. Again, if you could keep it to five minutes, I mean, we would appreciate that, but uh, we, we certainly do want to hear from you. Ms. Staley, are you coming forward? I am coming. Very good. If there's other folks who'd like to speak to this item as well, we would ask you just to be prepared after uh, Ms. Staley is, is completed. So don't start talking just yet. You do have the podium. Whatever you're going to, or someone's going to. Go right ahead, Ms. Staley. I, I have a little overhead. That will be prepared. Okay. These past, uh, Teresa Staley, Sioux Falls, uh, these past weeks there's been a lot of community discussion about our water and sewer rates. And I believe that the public, keeping the public informed, having them participate, and having them in the know about our financial affairs is a very, very healthy thing. As I have been visiting with people across our city, I've been hearing some common concerns one of them is that we want to be known as a city that cares about all of its people despite what their economic status may be. We want to be a city with a heart and a city that works to keep the cost of living reasonable for everyone. Another thing that I'm hearing from people is that there is a hunger for government that tightens its belt and uses tax dollars and fees in the most efficient way possible. People want accountability. Let us never forget the fiasco that had happened a few years ago at the fairgrounds when the manager out there stole over $600,000. There were questions that arose in the midst of that, but people said, oh, everything's fine, everything's okay. Probing into the depths of an issue, asking questions, and looking at all sides of an issue is very important for citizens to do, and it's also important for elected officials to do. And sometimes after you've journeyed down that road and looked at things, you have to say no and you have to vote no. I have been concerned about these steep rate increases in our water sewer bills for several years. I've had several conversations through the years with Mark Cotter about it. And after I saw the rate chart that you'll see up there that was provided by the Public Works Department for the past, present, and future plans of the increases, I have felt I had to speak out. Notice that this whole thing was implemented in 2007, back before we had the collapse of the stock market and our economy, economic downturn. According to the city, our city has already raised our sewer rates 72% in the last four years, and they have a plan to take the range to the 93%. The water bill is also coming along with this increase in double digits. Kathy Brechtelsbauer was quoted in the Argus Leader today talking about the compounding effect of these rates in a 10-year period of uh, equaling 175%. Several weeks ago, I got a history of, a of five families' water bills from 2007 to the present, and I found out that an average family is paying anywhere from $230 to $330 more a year for the same usage that they were four years ago. And I've been encouraging people to get their own history of their water bills and see for themselves. Now, we heard from a North Dakota consultant two weeks ago, this fellow over here, that our city has, is servicing 46,000 families. And this man, by the way, is increased, it has been encouraging us to have these increases. Now, if you multiply 46,000 families by an average of about $220, we're bringing in over $10 million extra dollars a year. Mr. Cotter just said we have an $8 million budget. So where has this extra $10 million been going? Speaking of the consultant, next slide, please. Um, Mark Cotter gave me the, uh, the, the breakdown of what we've been paying this guy. Now, that is not my, my chart. Do not take this off my time, please. There we go. Okay, so we've got this guy that we paid him 2000, in 2007, $77,000, 2008, $79,000, 2009, $82,000, and 2010, $65,000. That comes out to almost $305,000 to tell us that we should be raising our rates. Now, Mr. Mayor, that would buy a heck of a lot of snow gates. 
$305,000. And also that would cover a lot of that, uh, we're talking about the extra uh, man hours that it takes to operate those snow gates. So I think that would be a creative way of looking at using that money in a, in a more efficient way for the citizens. Why aren't we using people from our own financial department and other people from the, the public works department to help with these rate increases, looking at what we need and how much more we need to charge? The last thing that I'm, I'm concerned about that I'm hearing from citizens is the issue of the infrastructure and the second penny. Now, that said, we just heard Mr. Cotter say that we used to be, fund this through grants, and they're gone now. So we've put it on the backs of the user fees. And, and we all know that we need to take care of this infrastructure, the, the sewer system, of course. But it's about priorities. And if you ask people, would you rather fix the sewers and, and not have a backup or have a $5 million River Greenway project down on 6th Street, they would probably choose the sewers. And I know that we're going to say it's been a business. We haven't used a second penny for sewers. But that doesn't mean we can't be creative and go that route and look at it. Kenny Anderson's even inferred that we should look at other financing uh, sources for this. So to me, it's about priorities. It's about using the existing revenue more efficiently. Families are having to do that. Businesses are having to do that. And our city needs to do that as well. So I urge you to vote no on this increase today. Thank you. Ms. Shelley, great job with your time. That was very good, very productive. Is there anyone else in the audience who'd like to speak to the City Council? Very good. City Council, do you have any questions or comments for uh, any of the speakers tonight? Or would anybody like to make a motion? Yes, Councilor Anderson, Jr. Um, got a couple questions from Mark Cotter, please. Mr. Cotter. Mark, you and I have had some discussion on this issue um, as late as today, mm -hmm. and I had some questions for you. Were you able to come up with any oh, numbers uh, on some of the things that we discussed this afternoon? We do, um, and if I restate your question, is that okay? Sure, yes, had, please, Mark. Yes, one, of the, one of the questions that came up today was, well, first, the first one was, could we put second penny sales tax dollars into this fund? And then the other one was, um, if we don't move forward tonight with this 5% mid-year rate increase, what impact does that have in 2011 and, and going forward? Um, I'll have Steve address those number of issues that we talked about since we've been, since we talked earlier. And then the last one, Mark, was taking this 5% and stretching it out over a longer period, either two or three years. Very good. Uh, he'll address okay. both those, and then I will follow up with the second penny into the fund. Here, here, here. Councilor Anderson, in terms of the question on, on dollars, and I don't know specifically where you're going, but at the last pr presentation we made, if you elect to not implement the mid-year increase of 5% and you want it to still meet your, your, all of the different provisos that we have in terms of the rate modeling when we work annually with the city, this is the graphic that we prepared in, in preparation for that. And so I think Mark alluded to in his presentation, avoiding double-digit rate increases moving forward. <coughs> If we were to not imp increase the rates further than 3%, which is shown in 2011 here, you can see the precipitative drop of cash that we'd have from 11 to 12. And it, and it would be further than, greater than that if we didn't increase the rates by 12%. And then we'd need another 12% increase in 13. We'd need an 8% increase in 14. And then we should be getting down to more of those, closer to that 3 to 4% inflationary rate in 15 and beyond with that type of model. I'm not sure if you want to look at it another way. I also scribbled there, and I don't have the best handwriting, but at the top there, 1% of rate revenue in 2011 total rate revenue is about $183,000. And so if you want to know the impact of, for instance, if you didn't do a rate increase of 12%, but you did in 10, that would be roughly $360,000 that we wouldn't then have in 2012 to work with. And one of the I guess the luxuries of early rate increases and the curses of waiting is that 360000 would then be present every year after that. And so if, if, if I had the model and I was doing this on the fly, you can see that a, a slight increase in an early year 
is worth a, a really big increase in the out years, and it's really, really similar to that graph that Mark showed earlier with waiting on increases than having to have them. So I hope I answered your question satisfactorily. Yeah, I guess if we, we completely avoided increases, f further increases in 11, 5% using these numbers is roughly around $875,000. I think I rounded down to 175 for simplicity. And we're only at half of that, so that's $437,500 that we would be gaining through the increase that you've at, we've asked for for 2011. And then that 437 will be present in all of the out years after that as a foundation along with any other increases that we implemented. Councilor Anderson, Jr., you had a couple of questions. Did Steve answer both of them or one of them? Yeah. Okay, Steve, once again, now if we take that 5% that we're looking at trying to do this year and July 1, and I understand that there's going to be that gap from July 1 to January 1. Okay. Okay. Is there anything we can do with our capital funds to assist in keeping these rates down for at least the rest of this year and then extending those once the, the, what I'm trying to do is I don't I'm, I don't disagree with the rate increase in total but I do believe that right now in the middle of the year when people are seeing everything going up around them except their wages um, that this is going to be something that is going to impact the lower segment of our community. And I'm looking at ways that we can try to lower this impact. And that's what I'm asking for, from you guys, is not to just give me these numbers here, is tell me what else can we do. You guys are the professionals. I'll turn things over to Mark in a minute, but I guess one thing, and, and, and it was mentioned earlier by the, the citizen that spoke, there was suggestion that a west was recommending these rate increases. I think it's very important to understand the process that we go through. You, you, you and your staff, or your staff with your approval puts together a budget annually that, to try to run the utility. And then there's also a capital improvements plan put together. And our job is to really take a robust spreadsheet model and analyze the impacts of those programs. If we then come up with increases that look out of whack or, or, or lumpy or are too high in, in, over time, we will come back and say, here's the sensitivity of the, the modeling that we've done to the programs that you want to put in place. And then ways to mitigate that, as you, as you suggested, um, some, some ways are to defer capital improvements, others to take a close look at operating costs, but you can see those have been flat for three or four years, so there's very little wiggle room there. Another is, is, is maybe not so exciting, but it's to use the debt market and try to smooth out the impacts and that type of thing. And so, and, and because we're not your master planners, if that's fair, we don't have the luxury of identifying how all that's done. And so I just wanted to give that clarification, and I'll turn things over to Mark to answer the specific question. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Um, a couple of points about putting second penny sales tax in. You and I talked about this earlier today, that the council does have a resolution that, uh, that speaks to the funding level of the general fund that at the end of, the, at end of any given year, you need to have 25% of the operating budget um, in the bank as an unreserved fund balance. The last paragraph in that resolution speaks to the utility funds. And that speaks to that they need to be stand on their own. And that, to me, my interpretation is that means to not commingle the funds. I would tell you that I think from a proactive standpoint, this council um, has been very supportive of conservation programs and each year in our water utility we fund about 300, 300 to $325,000 rebate program each year and that that really hits the high flow toilets which is in the lower, uh, older areas of our town so it really allows them to change out those toilets which is a high water user. Um, we also have um, you know a number of other things that you can do throughout your home and then also to upgrade to the high efficiency dishwashers. And so two of the highest water users using facilities in your house, we've made a commitment with your um, support to actually help people reduce their water usage, which in turn reduces the expenses at the water plant and then ultimately reduces the expenses at the water reclamation plant. So ultimately those utility bills can be lower. So there's been a very good approach, I think, over time with rebate um, 
to help stave off some of those rates and really have kept it from a very small m monthly charge and only build on usage. But I understand rates are difficult, but I can tell you, you know, I've certainly looked at this. We've looked at the issues that we faced last year. Um, we've prioritized the projects. Um, it is our recommendation to continue to keep those projects on track so we can protect those areas of the city that didn't have that protection. Okay. Councilor Kowski. Uh, yes, a couple things. First of all, I can appreciate the need to bring in an outside expert. Um, you, while your department does a good job, I, I know that this is a lot of detail and stuff, so I'm glad that you're here to answer questions tonight. I was just curious, how does, um, we don't meter our wastewater, obviously. We meter our, our water usage. And uh, explain to me how that's tied to our sewer rate, it, and I'm sure you've done this before, but just to clarify that for myself. And th the reason I asked the question is, back on April 4th, we had, a, um, had an assumption table on your presentation, and we're factoring in a 0% growth in water sales, basically for this year, and only half a percent for future years, mm -hmm. not to nitpick or anything, but how would, if those numbers were higher, our, our water usage higher, how would that affect our sewer rate? Um, well, they're drivers, and that's why um, we're fortunate that Steve works with us on both. One of the, um, uh, one of the components as, um, I want to make sure I just lost my train of thought on your first question. On your, I'm sorry. The sewer bills. Let me go back to that one first. The sewer bills, we actually, so we don't um, look at if you have outside water use, whether it's watering a garden, watering your lawn, washing the car. We take a snapshot of your water usage in November, December, January, and February. We average it, and that becomes the residential bill for that next year. Okay, so that's how residents know what their uh, usage is. We, we want to make sure that that's a true winter usage. It's all inside usage, so we believe that any water that's being used from November through February is likely going down the drain in your house and going down the sewer, as opposed to it's different in the summer. And that's for the driver on a residential customer of what is your sewer bill. And it was said last week, if you want to actually conserve on your sewer bill, those are four months to uh, conserve on. Um, but I would, you know, to me that that is, um, that's the driver. Now on commercial accounts, it's on a monthly basis because in most of those cases, if they use the water, it's actually going down uh, the drain. So that's on a monthly uh, basis. Does that answer your question? And now on the second, there on the, on the assumptions in the model, we've kind of taken, now that we've done this for four years, um, we had some initially, we had some fairly high projections. Um, because the city was growing at, in some cases, we were maturing 1,000 acres a year, so we're adding meters, selling more water. But on the other side, we really started to see um, the conservation rebate program take a hold, and a lot of conservation came across our entire city with those programs. And so each year, we kind of try to dial that in because ultimately, we want to be conservative, but not ultimately conservative. And how we drive that water sale is also how we drive the sewer bills. I'm going to let Steve kind of elaborate on that as well. Mayor, there, um, <coughs> Councilman Karski. In terms of the mathematics of it, we talked last time about how there's about it. The minimum is about two to three dollars. So on a twenty-some dollar bill, we're looking at about ten percent of the cost as a minimum. And we're growing that minimum already at 1% a year. And so we're taking advantage of the growth in meters that relates pretty much with the population growth within the community. On the water side, that's, that's the volumetric side would be the other 90%. And so as you pointed out, if we were to make an assumption of some greater volume growth over time, that would be 90% of the revenue for this utility from rate revenue standpoint, and it would mitigate any increases we have. However, and I'll take the blame for this, or the credit, I guess, depending on how you feel the answer. I've really pushed in the near term not to look too aggressively at volumetric increases. And the reason for that is we're just not seeing it here, and we're not seeing it anywhere in the region. Whether we blame the 1991 plumbing code where they implemented very restrictive 
um, faucets for your showers, um, low flush toilets, all of those types of things, whether we look at um, the fiscal impacts of people's knee-jerk reaction to raising water rates and, and wastewater rates, the, we usually, the elasticity of that is usually not long-term, but if you do raise people's rates in the near term, they'll tend to back off some in their overall usage. Um, whether we look at just the overall green movement within the United States and people's sensitivity to being better stewards for how much water they use and, and the resulting wastewater that gets discharged, or we specifically look at the programs you've put in place to encourage conservation, both through your pricing structure on the water side where you have steeper costs for the bigger users, as well as the rebate program, we just are not seeing anywhere in the region where people's per capita water demands are going up, but actually they're all trending down and as a result uh, we haven't even maintained the zero percent. In all fairness, we've actually been going down a little bit, but we just didn't feel that it was appropriate to put negative percentage growth in for water use in the model. And, and, and then each year we look at that again, and if we see that flatten or we see that start to uptick, we'll certainly put those more aggressive increases out in the future, but we just don't think they're going to happen, and so we hate to mislead you. Councilor Anderson, Jr. Mark, could we go back to uh, showing the rate hike uh, structure that you guys have set up here for? That slides? Uh, no, the one that shows the percentages per year. I think you oh. had one that would show. Oh, you didn't um, have it on I think this. that was uh, Ms. Staley's. Ms. Staley had oh, that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sorry for the Thank confusion. you very much, Ms. Staley. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And Steve, correct? Steve, this, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you talked about Omaha and their challenges. Uh, and spoke about a one billion dollar uh, funding, mm -hmm. and then you stated that uh, their rates by 2015 would be about 2345. Just their fixed charge. Making sure. Right. Because there's two components of a sewer bill: is there's a fixed charge, uh -huh. and there's the usage charge. Okay. Well, he just said 2345, so that's just what I wrote down. What would be the total then? 3390. Okay. Anderson. Of which 2345 of that would be the fixed charge for no usage, so they'd only be charging ten dollars and forty-five percent, ten dollars and forty-five cents that people had control over, and the rest of it they'd get a bill no matter what they did. So one unit of consumption would result in 23.45 plus a two-dollar consumption charge. So if we continue at the pace that we're looking at in the projections we've done in the model, and we look at the other graph that we've shown you, Omaha will be well ahead of us by 2014. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I was headed in that direction, but. Mayor, can I just add one comment? Mr. Conner? I think one of the things that I think we're very fortunate is that we didn't, we don't want this to seem reactionary. There has been a very comprehensive capital plan that's been put into place. We've been backing it with rate increases to meet what we feel is a very responsible capital plan. And then we did have the occurrence last year. So we didn't have to, in many cases, create the new projects. We just moved them up. And so um, incrementally, it's not going to affect our rates like some of the issues that are going to affect um, many towns in the Midwest, but um, we just highlighted Omaha tonight as one of them. So, uh, With the City Council's permission, Mark, on the uh, age of the sanitary sewer uh, map, there, even after we do all the improvements uh, projected through 2025, there are still some items that are purple. Uh, just to give a sense of security to the city of Sioux Falls, why would we allow that to continue if they're 50 years old plus? Is it a different type of material? Well, one of the key things about sanitary sewer pipe is is the condition, but also what's the environment that it's in. Some of these are in a very corrosive environment, like the central main. Um, by the time it gets to there, it's starting to go into a septic mode, and that's why you see so much gas. In some of those, uh, it may be purple and it's older, but we're not seeing any structural impacts and those are pipes that we expect to see even a longer life out of. And so there are some pipes in that area that we do expect to do a liner, um, which is a uh, non structure it's a structural liner, but we don't have to excavate the street. So we'll try to maximize every capital dollar and just put a new what they call an in situ liner in those uh, pipes. 
Um, in some of the cases with pipes, we'll do the same strategy as we did last year. When the collapse occurred, what we'll actually put inside a pipe, um, because these new pipes have such a smooth glass-like flow characteristic, so even though we reduce our, our diameter, we can um, still achieve some of the same flow characteristics with the new smaller, um, uh, new smoother pipes. City Council, thanks for the opportunity. Mark, mm -hmm. thank you as well. City Council, any further questions or would anybody like to make a motion? Move to approve Karski. Second, Antonin. Councilor Karski has made a motion to approve uh, item number 22. This is the second reading. It was also seconded by Councilor Antonin. Uh, is there any further discussion on this item? Councilor Urbanbach. I want to just tell you a quick story. Whatever day that was in August last year when we all came home and there was a map on Kello of like half, it looked like half the city or more than half the city. And the, the anchor man was saying, the mayor says, don't flush your toilet. And there's going to be backup into the, all the basements in this whole area. There were elderly people in that area on fixed incomes who were scared and who struggled to get items out of their basement. And I'll tell you, it's a good thing my mom has me and my teenage kids because we worked our rear ends off, hauling things out of the basement, putting them up at a point where they would be safe because we knew this was coming. This sewer had breached. It was really frightening. And it was really just a pipe. But it was frightening to these people. I want you to understand that I don't like raising these rates. But what happened that my mom's basement did not get flooded and lots and lots of based basements did not get flooded, thank you, Mr. Mayor, because we used the reserves that we had on hand and we were able to put cash on the barrel head and buy that pipe right now, get it in place, and get that fixed. I need to vote for this sewer increase, the sewer rate increase, so that we have that cash on hand again so that your mom's basement doesn't get flooded either. That's the point. And we do live in a community where people care because what we're doing is we're sharing in the costs of caring for each other. We don't live in a vacuum. And we don't get to pick and choose the things that we want to pay for. We all care for the city of Sioux Falls, and we all care that our sewer system is up to standards. I'm going to vote yes on both of these. Number one, because the people who elected me in the Central District are going to benefit Big time. Thank you, the rest of the city of Sioux Falls, because we are the ones, if you look at the old pipes, it's the central district. And it's the central district where so many sewers are backing up and so many people on fixed incomes and elderly folks are struggling. They're giving up their days in the summer to muck the crud out of their basements. I'm voting for the people in my district. Councilor Brown. There is no way to dress up a vote like this. It, it does stink, pun intended. That's just the way it is. Um, tonight, there's a clear choice. We either raise fees or we use taxes. Given that choice, I would rather raise the fees and I control in my house how much water or sewer I use versus moving to a system. And Mark Cotter is right. This council set a policy saying that those are to stand on their own. If we want to change that policy, we can do that as a council. But tonight the policy is that those utilities stand on their own. And I would much rather pay for what I use than to have to subsidize my neighbors for wasting water and sewer. There has been a motion that was made by Councilor Karski, seconded by Councilor Entman on item 22. Since there is no further discussion, let's have a roll call vote, please. Councilors Karski? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? No. Brown? Yes. Entman? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. That has passed five to one. Item 23. Second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the revised ordinances of the city, revising sewer utility rates and charges as found in Chapter 41, Utilities. Rate changes effective January 1st, 2012. Mr. Connor. Mayor and City Council, this builds upon the presentation we just provided, and we are, again, are here to answer questions, but this reflects the recommended rate increase that would take place January 1 of 2012. Mr. Connor, thank you. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak to this item number 23? Ms. Staley, welcome. Uh, 
Well, I, I, I guess I, this kind of overlaps from what we were just talking about, but you were talking about conservation, and I'm all for conservation, but it's like you're penalizing people for being conservative, and you're jacking up their rates. And, and uh, Vernon, I'm glad you brought the thing up about the ordinance because nothing is written in stone here, and there is flexibility. And, and w if we remember that this thing was funded in the past by grants, and so now if that's not available, maybe we need to be creative in looking at other w other sources for funding this. And Michelle, nobody, I'm not saying we shouldn't take care of the sewer system. Nobody wants that to happen, and I didn't want people's basements to be flooded. I think it's a huge priority. And I've watched through the years how this council has voted to, to fund things that are amenities that have nothing to do with the basic essentials of our city. And when you talk to people, what is infrastructure, they'll say sewers and roads. They think that is the basic underlying, underlying uh, thing that supports our city. So uh, I'm all for supporting that. I think most people in our city are as well, um, but again, I think Raising a tax when you don't re raising a fee when you don't really need to, sending a message to the public works to say take this money you're getting that 10 million extra and use it in a, a more efficient way, you know. And I, I know that the public wor public works has its own f fund, but I happened to go looking for Mark Cotter last week, and the public works department is closed. And I opened the door up. They're down in engineering. Here, it's all gutted in there. So we're doing a huge renovation project in the Public Works Department. Apparently, there's a lot of extra money for this. So it's, it's all about priorities, and it's about digging in and saying, are we, get, are we really being efficient with this? And Mayor Huther, I think you have, when you were running last year, you talked about that. Yeah. And so I just stay the course and be accountable to the public. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. We appreciate that. Is there anyone else in the audience who'd like to speak to this item? Mr. Stengel, welcome. How are we doing? I know, Mark, you probably inherited something that you didn't want to inherit. It's probably about 50 years, you know, far down. But I guess my question is, Mark, do you ever see, foresee that the water that is being used is going to go down so far that eventually you're going to have to raise the minimum rate on customers? You know what I'm talking about? Mr. Carter, I think that uh, what Mr. Sting is asking is that Correction. if the uh, if the rates get to the too high to where the demand for water is diminished because the rates are so high, then the water usage drops so much, how would that impact you? Um, I would say, you know, we closely, and I think that's one of the key reasons why we do these annual rate reviews, um, is so we can closely look at the projections and then tweak our model going forward. Um, but I would say we're right there right now that our projections are very close to what we're seeing. And if we do see a dry year, we do see additional revenue that will come in from the people that irrigate their lawns. But I would say right now, because we've been progressively turning this down, our projections for the last two years. So at this point, I think our projections um, with Steve's assistance are in very good shape. So you believe the, uh, the demand will stay at a reasonable rate? I don't foresee it, and I would also say you know, our city is um, a great city, and people, as you see some of the projections as, as we expect to grow over time, that will be additional meters, additional water flowing through those meters, and that is the key reason why long-term we've uh, invested in Lewis and Clark. Very good. Mr. Stengert, did that answer your question? Very good. Thank you, Mr. Stengert. That was a good, very good question. Folks, anybody else would like to speak to this item? Very good. Council, do you have any questions or comments or a motion? I would move approval. Urbanbach. I'll so, second it, Brown. Councilor Urbanbach made a motion to approve. It was seconded by Councilor Brown. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any further discussion on this? Hearing none, uh, if we could have a roll call vote, please. Councilor Skarsky? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Antman? Yes. Urbanbach? Yes. Thank you, City Council. That's passed 6 to 0. Item 24. 
Second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, providing supplemental appropriations for a market analysis providing the value of naming rights and facility sponsorship packages for an event center and other city facilities, $65,000. Mr. Smith, welcome. Good evening. Darren Smith, Director of Community Development. Uh, as you know, uh, item 24 is a request for a supplemental appropriation uh, for funding a naming rights and sponsorship market analysis. Uh, you'll also recall last week I uh, uh, gave a fairly detailed presentation on just what a naming rights and sponsorship market analysis would mean in Sioux Falls. And so I won't, uh, I won't go through that entire presentation again, but I, I would like to, uh, with your permission, uh, briefly recap what I see as the highlights uh, just the highlights of that presentation. Um, first of all, as you know, uh, Steve, these are not mine, by the way. These are not mine. Um, starting with what is uh, the naming rights market analysis, if I can again just briefly read to you what I provided last week. The objective of a naming rights market analysis for our purposes would be to provide a market analysis of a potential event center. The analysis should provide the value of the naming rights and facility sponsorship packages, identify marketable assets and associated facility sponsorship opportunities, and identify other marketing sales opportunities for revenue generation. That's what it is. What it is not, again, just briefly, we are not paying someone this amount of money to develop a name for a potential event center. We are not selling the name on the building uh, for $65,000, which happens to be the amount of the request for supplemental appropriation. So we are not doing those things. Again, what we are doing is attempting to have a professional analysis done that can tell us what we can reasonably expect to generate in the form of naming rights and sponsorship revenue in this uh, uh, new event center. What will we get? Again, I'll break it down into three tasks very briefly. Uh, task one is uh, exclusively focused on an event center analysis in a number of different ways. Task two then moves into um, an event center strategic account plan in terms of developing that and producing that for us. And finally, task three is, is uh, uh, conducting the same type of analysis on three major public facilities uh, in addition to the event center. And those three would be the zoo, the Washington Pavilion, and the convention center. The terms, task one will be completed in 45 days. That's 45 days after approval of this uh, uh, supplemental appropriation, if, if that's uh, the direction of the council. Uh, and 45 days also after uh, the uh, firm is put under contract. So earlier, uh, or last week rather, I was talking about uh, early June, June 7th. Well, that's with approval tonight and putting uh, the firm under contract as early as tomorrow. And I understand and, and I can uh, see that we are a couple council members short tonight and so there's a possibility of a deferred vote. But if it is approved tonight, we'd be looking at early June for those results uh, for task one. If it is deferred to the next council meeting, uh, May 2nd, then we'd probably be looking uh, at something more along the lines of late June uh, for these results. Task two would then be completed 30 to 60 days after completion of task one. Task three, likewise, would be completed in 30 to 60 days after completion of task two. Uh, so all of this would be done, again, if it, if it is approved tonight, would be done probably on the, uh, as early as Labor Day, as late as early October. And if it's deferred a couple weeks, then just back that timeline up a couple weeks. So probably late September to late October for all three tasks. That's all three tasks. The negotiated package price of doing all three tasks is $65,000, including all travel that is required, which would be multiple trips for the firm. I also last week uh, touched on, in addition to what we get for this analysis, what's involved, I touched on the process, um, uh, inviting proposals, receiving proposals, reviewing and evaluating those proposals, and then ultimately our our unanimous selection for the firm that we would like to recommend to put under contract and conduct this analysis for us. Uh, tonight, uh, that firm is here, and I would like at this time to introduce 
Uh, Mr. Miles Gallagher, he's the president of the Superlative Group Incorporated out of Cleveland, Ohio. And he is here tonight uh, to be with us to um, uh, discuss briefly what it is his organization does on a regular basis, uh, to provide some specifics uh, related to what we are asking him to do for our purposes in Sioux Falls with this project. Uh, and then finally, he'll attempt to answer any and all of your questions. So with that, Mr. Gallagher. Thanks, Darren. Mayor, Council, thanks for inviting me as your guest to uh, Sioux Falls. As Darren explained, our firm, uh, the Sproler Group, we're headquartered in Cleveland, and we do naming rights analysis and sales for public infrastructure projects. So we've taken our, um, our skill set, which has developed selling naming rights for professional sports venues, like the Great American Ballpark in Cincinnati, Progressive Field, including Ohio, and U.S. Cellular Field in Chicago. And we've taken that skill set and brought it to public infrastructure. We like to represent the taxpayer. And where we developed a company or started it representing the wealthy team owners, and it was quite lucrative, we decided that it would be good be, to be the firm that, rep, that represents the taxpayer. And our business has flourished. So what, we've, uh, what we were asked to do is put together a proposal, which we did, and we're happy to be selected to work on uh, the new event center, the valuation of naming rights. And we've done so for four sim very similar facilities. The Cintas Center for Xavier University, Fifth Third Arena for the University of Cincinnati, Chaffetz Arena for uh, St. Louis University, and most recently, Interest Bank Arena for Wichita, Kansas. Um, our analysis will include the value of the total naming rights of the facility. We'll look at individual aspects of the facility that can bring in additional incremental revenue. We'll look at major sponsorship categories, like pouring rights for soft drinks, official telecom partners, which can also include equipment that you'll need in the facility, and what you can expect to get in those categories. We'll look at terms of those, those contracts. So naming rights can be a 20, 25 year. We've done them as long as 30 year contracts for the sponsorship or the naming right. And telecoms are 10 to 15 years. Pouring rights are almost always 10 years. Um, and we'll break all that down and we'll list it to you so you can see the cash flow of your building. So these are all the, and today at the four o'clock meeting, it was referenced by you, Mayor, as what would be the, the private sector contribution. And we look at that as what private sector dollars will cash flow through the building. So it can be used for either, um, some groups will use it for uh, the building costs, others will look look to those revenues as the operating costs of the buildings. But you need to know what will the cash flow be that comes through the building in this sector. We're also going to look at premium seating. How many sky boxes should you build? How many club seats? How many loge boxes? What should you charge for those? And what should the terms of the contracts be? We almost always recommend that you, you stagger contract lengths in things like premium seating. Because once you sell the facility once, you don't want to have to sell it completely every few years. So you'll have some of your contracts will expire at three years, five years, seven, or even 10 years. And that gives you contractually obligated income for up to a decade long on seating, which is something that, again, will help you cash flow the building. So I'm here to answer questions. I'm sure you have some. Uh, what can I tell you about our firm or, or how we do things? Darren, can I ask before, uh, before we begin questions, uh, is there anyone else who wanted to speak to this item t tonight before we, um, Darren? Yeah. Uh, yes, I would, uh, and the order uh, makes no difference to me. Um, uh, we can have uh, Mr. Gallagher take questions related to the naming rights analysis uh, and that process now. Okay. But I would like, um, just briefly, uh, Tracy Turback, our finance director, to speak uh, about the value of of uh, the professional analysis to him and the work that you'll be asking him to do. And then also uh, Mark Cotter, Public Works Director, right. to speak to the, the uh, financials involved with this process to date. Well, as Ms. Staley said, maybe we should be as productive as we can be uh, first. So why don't we finish the presentations and then we'll allow the City Council to ask all of you questions as, as needed. Ms. Turback. Thank you, Mayor. Councilors, Tracy Turback with Finance Office. Uh, as I mentioned earlier this afternoon, the uh, private money funding component of this project is expected to be 
uh, very, very important to the overall funding package. The uh, naming rights and sponsorships will make up a, is expected to make up a significant portion of that private money funding for this project. So that, the, the market analysis uh, that's proposed to be done for naming rights and sponsorships will provide uh, a, a much higher level of reliability in terms of the numbers that we will put in our funding plan for this project than what we will uh, be able to do without such a market analysis. So for me, that's really the importance at this stage of the project uh, is to uh, obtain as reliable of information as we can uh, so that we can put together a, a reasonable, uh, achievable financing plan for the project. Now, further down the road, this analysis will become even more important uh, when it comes time to actually sell sponsorships and naming rights so that we know we're getting really what the market uh, says we should get for these, these services. So uh, from my standpoint, it's, it's critical that we get reliable information, that we're not just uh, simply speculating or basing our funding plan on what other communities saw, what happened in, in Wichita or Duluth or Memphis may be interesting, but it doesn't necessarily tell us uh, what we can expect from these sources of funding here in Sioux Falls. So I would encourage you to move forward with this uh, market analysis to provide us with that uh, much more re reliable information at this stage in the process. Mr. Mike, thank you. Mr. Conner? Thank you, Mayor and City Council. Mark Howard with the Office of Public Works. I just have five slides I wanted to just take you back to that point in mid-2010 of when we created the project. Could you go to the first slide, Steve? Um, in 2010, as, as we start to plan the CIP today, um, the Department considered Event Center and the project called Event Center was included in the 2011 plan. Um, we initially looked at it as a $500,000 funding stream for 2011 and then an additional 500000 in 2012. Okay. Originally, when we, when we identified what that amount should be to get, to take this from a very, what I'd consider general sense to more specific, um, we identified $500,000. Now, the way we originally broke that out was the architect and engineer to do schematic design, which would be far, en far enough along so the constructor could give us a, a very good and relevant cost estimate, was 400000 And then for the construction manager at risk, we reserved $70,000, and then at that point, reserved a $30,000 contingency to start the work. Next slide. Um, well, with, uh, as the title says, with every uh, project and certainly project of this magnitude, it's a learning process. And we were able to build off of Sink Homes, the fact that they had, they had worked on previous studies for the city of Sioux Falls. And we asked them, would it be possible for us to reduce their fee from 400000 down to 340000 so we could do a couple other key things that we had been advised once we started this process that was important. So they were willing, and so we did reduce their fee from 400,000 down to 340. We kept the construction manager at risk at 70,000. But one of the key things we learned very early on um, is that the best time to negotiate these contracts with the professionals is now for the entire project. Assuming um, we receive a positive vote, then that contract is in place. Um, for that piece, and we don't get into a situation where we go through what we consider three phases. The first phase is the comparative analysis. The next stage is the uh, schematic design. And third phase, which only comes if there's a positive vote, would be final design. Um, we were advised the best time to negotiate that entire contract is up front before we start. And so that's when we brought Integra. They were the owner's reps for the, the recent Twin Stadium. That firm is um, very qualified to advise contracts on this size of projects. We brought in expert legal assistance locally with Jim Wiederich, and then 
Um, one of the key things we did early on is we were obviously working with the CSL group for a number of years. On the economic side, there was a desire to also add what the development side would be, the spin-off component um, for the comparative analysis, and that's where we found the $30,000 that was originally uh, the project contingency. Next slide. This is a slide that you've seen a number of times, but did want to highlight again as we walk through, as we started this back in mid-2010 to where we are today, once we identified what the architect and engineer, the constructor, uh, the contract advisors, the expert attorney, and AECOM, that um, took us to our $500,000 of allocation and then started to add the note that you've seen before that there may be additional cost and naming rights and market analysis um, has been listed on there. Next slide. And then just to close, um, obviously one of the things that we've learned not only on the Event Center project but many projects, whether you're building a library, um, a fire station, or um, a key public works project is that the more focused attention spent up front planning the project, evaluating the alternatives, determining the funding strategies and more will ensure a very successful project. And so I wanted to give you the breakdown of where we started and where we're at today. Scott, thank you. Folks, this is a second reading and because it is, you do have the opportunity to, to speak as well. Uh, is there anyone in the audience who'd like to speak to this item before we have the City Council ask questions or potentially make a, a, a motion? Mr. Stinger, welcome. I guess I've just got a couple questions. Let's say that uh, you come back and you say that uh, a potential revenue of uh, $15 million. Are you going to uh, give a list to the city council of potential uh, investors, or is it something that we got to rehire you for to um, go out and get the get the investors? Mr. Singer, would you mind asking all of your questions, or, or maybe that's the only one, and then well, we'll allow it, Mr. Gallagher to. Do you have additional ones as well? No, that's very good. just the two. You. That's a very good question. Thank you. Ms. Gallagher, just uh, one sec. Folks, are there any, is there anyone else who'd like to speak to this item? Well, very good. Mr. Gallagher, would we start, let's start, please, with answering uh, Mr. Stenga's question, and then we're going to sure. open it up to the City Council to, to ask you questions. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Stenga. That was a good question. Um, part of the scope of service is to list national, regional, and local companies that would have brands that would lend themselves to the new facility and give you a list of the ones that could afford to pay the naming rights over the term that we'll recommend. So there will be a target, we'll call it a target list, and we'll list how likely they are to buy that, whether it's naming rights of the entire facility, a concourse, entry plaza, things of that nature. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stan, did that answer your question? The, the, the answer was... Yeah. Address it to these to this list that you're going to give us. You mean to sell it? You'll have that option. The question, uh, the question, and, and then we'll, we'll we'll continue on. The question from Mr. Stang, who is in the audience, uh, folks, if you're watching back home, is um, will the list be provided to the city of Sioux Falls uh, during your initial uh, report? Yes, it will. Thank you. Thank you, City Council. Do you have any questions for Mr. Gallagher or for Mr. Cotter, for Mr. Smith? Or from Mr. Turbeck? Mr. Mr. Ensman. I have a question for you. <laughs> There's been a lot of people that have come up to us and said, well, just put a price on it and take the highest bidder for naming rights, for example, for the outside of the place. Uh, and it's my understanding, it's been pointed out to me, that there's a lot of opportunities. You mentioned pouring rights, whether it's uh, malt beverages or soda, I'm assuming. Soda is the only one that you can do legally do a pouring right on. Oh, that's something you I can't do alcohol. Either. Okay. But you work then with the construction folks and the architect engineers to make sure that we have the defined areas, defined enough that would meet the criteria of these major companies. Right. Is that we're, correct? Yeah. We'll work with your architects and designers to help them come up with the best ways for it to be presented to a sponsor. Yeah. We'll help okay. you find bigger, better areas 
you know, take, show you how to take a cinder block wall and change it maybe just a little bit so it can be used for signage, things like that nature, because it can be sold in a package. Don't front to me. Also, um, do you help to identify the possibility or, or the possibilities that other people outside of the city of Sioux Falls, not just major companies, but possibly some major uh, individuals that might have uh, connections, uh, whether it's family or just experience connections to our state, do you help to try to identify or go after folks like that too that might be out there? We can you quantify that? Or yeah, not? what we'll do is we'll give you fair market value. We'll show you what the elements are and what they're worth. And I think what you're referring to is more of a philanthropic gift. Yeah. Um, we've done that. At St. Louis University, um, we were able to get $12 million from a, from a graduate, wealthy graduate. But it was worth $12 million. So had they sold that to a corporate partner in St. Louis, we were able to show them that the value is $12 million. So when they presented to somebody who had a, an emotional tie to the university, and he said, how much do you want? And Father Bianchi said, $12 million. He said, you're crazy. He said, no, look, it's worth $12 million. We have a report. And we can show you that were you to buy it representing a brand, you'd have to spend $12 million. So he said, fine. And he paid 12 up front, which we were surprised. Cool. Councilor from the block. Thank you, Mr. Gallagher, for being here. I appreciate sure. it. I'm going to grill Darren just for a minute, if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah, that's <laughs> Thank fine. Thank you. I'm not going to really grill you, Darren. We have some really smart people in Sioux Falls and some really amazing companies and some study groups and all those kinds of places. Mm. Can't we do this locally? I mean, we always say shop local. Why can't we do this here? Yes, good question. Um, we, you know, in our uh, search and going through this process, we did want to we did want to be exhaustive. We did want to make sure we weren't leaving any stones unturned in terms of uh, what are those local resources before we have to consider going outside uh, city limits or the region for this type of expertise. Uh, I did uh, uh, just give you a sense of a couple of those phone calls. Um, I did uh, reach out to the local development foundation and Slater Barr, the president of the development foundation, um, and, and asked him and a consultant they actually have in town who's been in town the last several months helping them with their fundraising campaign for their, their economic development efforts, um, asked uh, uh, Slater uh, if this is something you know, they could possibly help with, if they have any expertise in this area. Uh, if not, do they know somebody out there? I also talked to the consultant that they have. Um, Slater's answer was very clearly no. Uh, that's not something we do. We have no expertise in that area. We've never done it before. Uh, we don't plan to do it. Uh, I did have a good conversation with their consultant who does fundraising all over the country for a number of different efforts. Uh, he said that this is a pretty specialized expertise. Uh, he would consider coming back and helping sell the event center of these areas um, if it came to fruition, but he was not capable and his firm were not capable of doing the analysis. In fact, he recommended a, a firm in the Denver area that did make our list and they were invited to submit a proposal. Ultimately, they did not. Um, also, uh, Council Member Anderson last week, I know you mentioned schools. Do, do some of our institutions of higher learning have this capability? Uh, you referenced the two local schools. Uh, but as I you know, had some conversations on that, I was really referred to the USD School of Business in Vermilion. Um, and I did contact Dean Keller down there. Uh, they're known you know, widely for their research, uh, quality research in a number of ways. Had a nice conversation with Dean Keller at the end of last week. And uh, again, uh, when I posed this question to him of if they could help us, uh, he said the short answer is no. Uh, he thinks there is the possibility they could help with this process in other ways down the road, um, some economic impact stuff and that type of thing, but not with this particular um, area. I also asked him how he felt about us pursuing this and using this type of expertise, and he thought it was, uh, it, it made a lot of sense. Uh, Councilor Bob. Just one more question then. Darren, why can't you and your staff or somebody here with the city do it for us for way less than this? Well, I, I struggle a little, this, uh, a little bit with this because uh, uh, I like to think I have some abilities uh, in different areas, but I do have to admit um, 
I, I don't have any in this area, so you would be asking a lay person in every sense of the word to do this. Um, as I mentioned last week, uh, would myself and some of our some of our staff in City Hall give it a shot and do the best we could? Absolutely. I'm convinced uh, Finance Director Turback is behind me cringing right now uh, with that statement, but uh, we would do our we would we would do our best. Uh, I would say, for what it's worth, that over the last several months and researching the different firms that do this and having an opportunity to talk with at least five or six of them, those uh, just like Mr. Gallagher, um, there is something to be said for the experience and the expertise. I, I think it's part science, part art. Uh, maybe Mr. Gallagher would agree or, or, or uh, disagree with that. Um, I just don't think we're going to do the job for, for the council members and the taxpayers that someone like Mr. Gallagher would. Thank you. Councilor Brown. Darren, I'm going to let you off for a little bit. I have some thank questions you. for Mr. Gallagher. Mr. Gallagher, thank you for coming to Sioux Falls. My we pleasure. appreciate you being here. I have a couple questions. My biggest concern in this event center is the operational costs long term, what it means to the city. As of today, we still don't know what those costs are, but you said you'd be able to address what the market value of that. No, the market value of the sponsorships, and then generally they can be used to offset some of the operating costs. Okay. We don't look at the operating costs of the building. We look at the cash flow from the sponsorships, the naming rights, premium seating. So we'll look at what kind of revenue can come into that building, but what it costs to operate the building, that's not what we do. But my comment is that Many institutions, like Xavier, UC, they take the money that we raise them in naming rights and they use it for the operating costs. Because almost always, with the exception of Dr. Schaefer, it's given the $12 million up front, it's an annualized payment. With, we'll usually do a consumer price index. So like Great American Ballpark started out at $2 million a year with the CPI, and it's $76 million all told. But when you're doing your study, wouldn't it be important to know that dollar value so you can figure that ratio out? Well, we know, the, we know, the, we know what we can raise, but, but we don't know what it's going to cost to operate the building. We don't know what kind of lighting you're going to have in it. We don't know, you know if it's going to be ice, how often it's going to be cooled. You know, that's not what we... We're not going to try to become experts in something. We know what we know. We so know in terms of the fundraising, there are still some holes in terms of gaps we don't know how we're going to fill. Well, I don't know if that's fundraising. I mean, that's... That's a building operating cost, and you'll probably have a building manager, and that's what a building manager will put together for you. In the presentations we've had, it, it's been talked about that we need 15 to $25 million in private funds to make this work. Do you ever deliver a report, report that says, you know what, city, you just, that money isn't there. You're not going to raise that kind of money. Um, it's not a vel attempt to get me to tell you how much it's worth, is it? <laughs> <laughs> um, We'll tell you what it's worth. Um, we won't inflate it, and you know, if, I don't know what it's worth today. Um, so I can't tell you. Have, so have you're I, telling me that that it? could come in less than? Uh, could, could come in more. I don't know. I haven't looked at. What we do is we value the media. We look at media impressions in your market. So, well, I never think I'm an artist. I think it's more based on science. We'll, we'll look at what's the media impression worth, how many impressions are you going to get, and we'll add all that up. We'll look at the demographic of who's going through the building. So that means we have to look at who are the tenants, how many event nights are you going to have. You know, if, you know, we, we look at things like, um, we, we've been hired by the London Olympics now, by actually by Lee Valley Park Authority that controls the London Olympic venues. Because once the Olympics are over in London, this park authority has to maintain the buildings for 30 years. And they don't have any budget. So we need to get back to them. Right now we're working on it. We have a staff over there. Coming up, what are the values? of the velodrome if they make it a venue for concerts and other things because a velodrome in London won't get 365 days a year with 6,000 people in it. It'll get a couple hundred people riding bikes. So we have to say, all right, if you change that to some type of, you know, amphitheater type, a 6,000 seat small arena in London, you can book 300 nights. And we look at it and say, all right, then the naming rights would be an upscale demographic because you're going to bring in concerts. But if it's people riding bicycles, eh, not so much, you know. So we have to know everything about the facility and come back to you and say, here's the values you can get. I don't know what it is. We, we haven't looked at the market in that, in that detail. We have to. 
And then what is the average difference in the market value you determined versus what actually is paid for naming rights in the studies that you do? Um, we fit our number in every market. So, um, and, and a, a good example, I was asked today, you know, what happened in Sedgwick County, Kansas. We told council that we said we'll get nine million for this, so we'll put it out there at eleven. And we knew we had some, we knew there were some factors that could go up and down. And the max offer we got was eight point seven five. And so, most of the council said, "Hey, that's pretty close." And one member said, "No, you said nine. We were able to go back to two other sponsors that we had talked to that were, we thought were, were good leads and were very interested. And we got one Cessna aircraft to pay three million for the entrance plaza. And then we got Spirit Aviation, which is the fuselage division of Boeing, which they spun off to pay $3 million for the concourse. So we told them nine, we ultimately delivered 14.75. So we didn't get an extra bonus, but when we hit the number, and when we were just shy of that number, you know, we weren't scrambling. We knew there were other live prospects out there. And how do you not just walk away from those people and find something else? You know, you found somebody, you know they have the budget. It's not quite where you need to be. What else do we have? You know, they like the project. Don't let them walk away without selling them something. So we were able to bring them back in, and, and we beat the number. And that's just how we do it. We, you know, we get paid to do that. Thank you. You're welcome. Councilor Karski. I, I, my uh, question, I guess, would be for Mr. Turbach. Um, you know, next week, we're expecting the study results to be published to us. And before we even do that, we're being asked to spend an additional $65,000 for um, the speculated event center. Um, I'm curious, what effect deferring this decision for a couple of weeks would have on the numbers that you come up with? Now, I understand that you're not the expert, and you're, you would just be plugging in numbers that you felt comfortable with. But is there more than that? What, what effect would a deferral of a couple of weeks until we can see what our study is coming down to is going to have on this? A couple of weeks, uh, the, the, the most significant difference, I suppose, Counselor, is that the, the, the proposed capital improvement plan that will come before the council in late June, uh, a couple of weeks will probably cost us meeting that deadline. So you would have a, a proposed funding plan in the capital improvement plan that comes before the council in late June with something other than a number based on a market analysis. Now, we would have that information before uh, August if that's the timeline for making a decision before the council makes a decision to put, put a project on the ballot. So in that respect, that the information would still be timely um, uh, before you know, we would have the information before you would be ha have to make a decision, but we wouldn't have the information in time to put it in in the funding plan that comes to the council. So you're saying that you'd just be, um, you wouldn't have any numbers in there or you would just be speculating in the numbers that you used? We would do the best we can to, to put some reasonable number in there, whatever that means. Okay. Councilor Antman. It would seem to me, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Mr. Gallagher, but it would seem to me the information that you're going to provide us is the information that people are going to have to take out there in order to be able to try to raise these private dollars that we need. In other words, you're identifying just about everything from naming seats to what the pouring rights might be for soda to maybe if there's a pizza, uh, right. money for a pizza stand, all of those kinds of things you're going to identify as opportunities for us to go out and try to sell to raise the money, the private money that we need, not only just from an operational standpoint, if that's where we need to do it, but also what those private naming rights for, for uh, philanthropists might be if they do exist, the dollar amount that we could raise as a potential for that, correct? Right. I mean, we, we look at all of the money that can be raised through naming rights, sponsorships, and advertisements throughout the facility. And with, when you do sponsorships, Often it includes something like if you do a sponsorship with a Coke or a Pepsi or a Dr. Pepper Snapple group in soft drinks, it will include that there's the only soft drink company that can be poured in the venue. Sponsorships for something like a beer or malt beverage, 
it cannot include the cash. You can't say, okay, you'll get the right to sell your beer. You can't, cannot include that. It's against the law. Doesn't mean you're not going to sell a lot of beer. Right. Just means you can't make them quid pro quo. They have to be separate. Okay. Darren, I have a question for you too. Mr. Mayor, may I? Councilor Um Darren, what is the timeline? Uh, this is the second reading then, and if yeah. we postpone this, can you run through the timeline with us again? Yeah, the, uh, the deferral, uh, if it's deferred, uh, we would ask that it be deferred to the next city council meeting, which is May 2nd, uh, which is approximately two weeks, well, exactly two weeks from tonight. Uh, so basically it would back everything up two weeks. Uh, if approved tonight and we could get Mr. Gallagher and his firm under contract and working as early as tomorrow, we would anticipate uh, uh, task one analysis uh, results uh, to be received on or about June 7th, give or take a couple days. So just back that up two weeks. And, and again, you're into late June, and I think that's what uh, Tracy was talking about with the CIP, the date earlier today, June 27th, and it starts nudging up against that. Okay, thank you. And also, if I could, just uh, one thing I, I wanted to make sure I mentioned, because I think it is important. Uh, we asked this as we went through evaluating uh, the design teams, the, the contractors, and so forth, that the group that put the proposal together and interviewed in front of us would, in fact, be the team that we were getting. Because what the design teams and the contractors and even these firms were getting the A team, so to speak, to, to come to town and make the proposals and uh, interview, but we wanted to make sure those were the teams we're getting. And so I did want to make it clear that earlier I introduced uh, Mr. Gallagher as the president of his firm, and in fact that is his title, but Mr. Gallagher will be personally managing this project. So there will be other staff uh, of his staff involved in doing their thing, but he will be personally overseeing this project and managing it for the city of Sioux Falls and uh, our process. I just wanted to make that clear. Councilor Anthony. If I could just make one comment, too. I, th I think what's really important here is that we've listened to a lot of folks this evening uh, with our water and sewer rates, a number of different things. And we also talk about the community as a whole, how giving our community is and how we do take care of those that are in need. But we also have to look at those people out there that, you know, want more for their children that are out there, too. We want to look at you know, what are the opportunities in the future that we're looking forward to? In an events center, while it's going to cost us money and is a significant uh, investment in our community, we all know that it is something that's going to last us for 50 plus years. Uh, we're further in this process than we ever have been. Um, it's exciting uh, to think about we might get something like this done in the future. Are we going to get it done? Only the voters are actually going to be able to tell us that down the road. And that's the promise that we have made to the voters in this city. And we need to provide them with the best information we possibly can as far as what are those opportunities. You know, what can we sell that seat for? How much money can we raise privately? And then I'm going to be right out there with the best of them trying to raise that money. So I really think that we really need to go ahead with this process. Um, and I'm prepared, Mr. Mayor, to make the motion upon your request. Vice Chair Aguilar, with your permission, could I just make a very, very brief comment? Thank you. There's a slide, if you wouldn't mind presenting that to the City Council as well as to the people of Sioux Falls. This is a council that is taking the responsibility of being fiscally conservative and prudent and maximizing the taxpayer dollar. I can assure you that, Sioux Falls. Uh, Councilor Karski is new to the team. Uh, he is a man who brings business sense to this council, uh, just like many of the many of the others. Uh, realizing that uh, Councilor Karski brings that business sense, I, I did want to present a slide not only to him today but to the people of Sioux Falls, because I know that he is personally concerned with this thirty-five thousand dollar investment and whether that would be a potential waste of taxpayer dollar. And I commend him for that. I, I, I did want to give you the potential return on the investment when it comes to, to this uh, particular item. Again, as Mr. Gallagher mentioned, uh, I, I don't know what that number is in terms of what we could actually earn. But let's just say, for example, that due to the efforts of Mr. Gallagher and his team, that he, they are able to identify an additional $10 million 
in potential private donations through these name and right efforts. That is a return on our investment of 285 times. Let's say it's less than that. Let's say that Mr. Gallagher can only generate an additional $5 million on top of what we would guess would be the appropriate dollar amount. That's 142, 142 times the return on the investment. Let's, let's just say that Mr. Gallagher and his team can only identify naming right opportunities that are worth an additional $1 million to the taxpayers in Sioux Falls. It's still a 28 time the return on the investment. Worst case scenario in my mind. Let's say that Mr. Gallagher, through all of his years of experience, he can only generate 35,000 additional dollars through his study. We still break even, Sioux Falls. We break even in an attempt to provide Mr. Turback, the city council, especially people like Councilor Vernon Brown, who has been very, very insistent that we come up with the best plan possible with real numbers, factual numbers, or, or the most factual that we can make them, uh, knowing that there is certainly uncertainty. Um, but it is a very limited risk and small price to pay to maximize the potential revenue and minimize the taxpayer expense. We have a financial obligation as a council and as the mayor and as department heads to not, not only minimize the expense side of the equation when it comes to this work that we're doing as counselors, but we also have a financial obligation to maximize the revenue side of the equation. And there's been a very, very clear call by this city council that this needs to be a private-public partnership. We need the private side of this town to step it up, and Mr. Gallagher and his team will help us, will help us do that. Councilor Aguilar, thank you for the opportunity. Councilor Mark. I just wanted to make a couple comments. I appreciate what you're saying, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, we can't really fully understand um, the total cost of this project without a plan for the naming rights. And, and in fact, without private money, this project, no matter where it goes, without private money, there is no event center. I, 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 I'm not a numbers person, but my hillbilly math says no private money, no event center. Um, I've also had people say to me, you know, we could just Google this and do it ourselves. Well, so I tried. And you know what? I can't figure it out. I can't look at event centers in communities just like Sioux Falls. I can't look at, um, you know, businesses that would be involved with that. Nothing makes sense. I can't do it. I'm sorry, Darren. Darren, you can't do it. And, and realistically, I want Darren to do his job. You know, I really need Darren to be our community development person. We need to bring in, a, in an expert when we're talking about this. It's just not good enough for us to try to wing this at this point. My biggest point then with this is whether the event center goes or not, and, and I agree, the folk, people are going to vote on this. Whether the event center goes or not really doesn't matter in, to me in this vote because we've left a whole bunch of money, in my mind, left a whole bunch of money on the table in terms of those other uh, publicly owned facilities in terms of the pavilion, the zoo, and the third one just went out of my head. The Orpheum Theater. Was it? No, it's not the Orpheum. It's convention. Oh, I'm so sorry. It is so late. Those three, but seriously, the point is that we have left money on the table because we didn't do this kind of study. I'm going to vote in favor of this because of that as much as anything. But at this point, then, if I, I would like to make a motion to defer this vote to May 2nd because I am uncomfortable with doing this kind of a move without all of our members here. So my motion is to move to no, May 2nd. Second, Aguilar. Councilor Rubenbach, a motion to defer this particular item to May 2nd. It was seconded by Councilor Aguilar. Uh, is there any further discussion on that? There is not. Very good. If we can have a roll call vote, please. Councilors Karski? Yes. Aguilar? 
Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Intamin? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. That is passed 6 to 0. Thank you, City Council. Uh, item number 25. <coughs> Second reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, authorizing the issuance of its wastewater system revenue bonds in one or more series to the South Dakota Conservancy District, authorizing the use of the proceeds thereof for capital improvements, pledging a portion of the wastewater system revenue of the city to the payment of said wastewater system revenue bonds, fixing the terms of such wastewater system revenue bonds, authorizing the execution and delivery of a loan agreement between the city and the South Dakota Conservancy District in authorizing the execution and delivery of such wastewater system revenue bonds to the South Dakota Conservancy District not to exceed $14,712,000. Ms. Connor, welcome. Thank you again, Mayor and City Council. Um, with me tonight is our bond council, uh, Mr. Doug Hayek, and he is here if you have any bond questions. Um, this is the bond for the next large sewer project, which will start at the Tud Hill lift station and move due west and provide that uh, relief to that lower part of our city. We also have uh, members of key staff from Public Works that, that are eager to get started with this project, get the design underway, and ultimately take it to construction. Um, we're here to answer any questions that you may have. Mr. Mayor. Councilor Rimbach. Can I ask just for a brief five-minute recess? Do you mind? I apologize for doing this in the middle of your presentation, but By is that all means. right? We just need to stretch. I'm sorry. <laughs> the City Council, you come forward with a recess? Yes. Well, folks, we're going to have a, uh, a three to five minute recess. Uh, thank you.
saying anymore uh, 30 seconds okay 30 seconds It'll be fine. folks in 30 seconds we'll start the, yep the meeting will resume 30 seconds give Tony a heads up down there we're on 25 right yep bring this meeting back to order uh, we are on item number 25 it is a second reading and mr. Cotter has just presented uh, some information to the City Council and asked at that point if there were any questions because it is a second reading I do want to ask is there anyone in the audience who'd like to speak to this item before the council has an opportunity to speak very good City Council any questions or comments on item number 25 hearing that would anybody like to make a motion move we approve the second reading Second Anderson. There was a motion by Councilor Anderson, seconded by Councilor Anderson Jr. to approve number item 25. If there's no further discussion, can, discussion, can I have a vote, please? Councilors Karski? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Intamin? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. That has passed 6 to 0. Item 26. First reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, a major amendment, petition number 2011-03-09 to Chapter 15.45.070, Plan Development Districts at South Beale Avenue, west of Explorer Elementary, amending the Bentwood Village Plan Development District sub-area regulations. Mr. Scott, Mr. Cooper, welcome. That's okay. As I've said before, I am still Mike Cooper, Plan Development <laughs> Services. Um, this is a petition by the developers of the Bentwood Village development, and this is located on the east side of Louise Avenue south of 69th Street and north of 85th Street. This is a multi-use, large-scale development that has been in place for some time. And the developers are asking the council to consider changing a portion of this development from single family to four unit townhomes. The area that's outlined on the screen is just to the west of the Explorer Elementary School. And this was originally planned for single family lots the developer believes that there's a strong market in this neighborhood for four unit townhomes and they are asking for this to be amended to allow that higher density housing use. City Council, any questions of Mr. Cooper at this time? And Councilor Anderson Jr. And I should have said this is on the east side of Tallgrass Avenue and not Louise. I'm sorry. I meant to say Tallgrass. Have we uh approached any of the neighborhood about this and gotten any comments from the neighborhood? There's really not a large um, existing development in there but yes the developers they are the ones doing this project and so they believe that it would be compatible yes yep Councilor Karski it, it appears this is right on the edge of the development is that the case it's on the very eastern edge yes okay mm -hmm. and the elementary school is just to the east of this proposed amendment Council, would anybody like to set a hearing date and second reading for Monday, May 2nd at 7 p.m. for item number 26? So moved, Aguilar. Second, Erpenbach. Was made by Councilor Aguilar, seconded by Councilor Erpenbach. Uh, could I have a roll call vote, please? 
Councilor Skarski? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Intamin? Yes. Urbanbach? Yes. Item number 27. First reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, a major amendment, petition number 2011-03-12 to Chapter 15.45.070, plan development districts at East 23rd Street and South Cliff Avenue, amending the Avera McKinnon Plan Development District. Mm. This is a petition by Avera McKinnon. The, they created their plan development zoning district back in 1992, which essentially includes their, their central campus area. The request before you uh, is to amend the list of allowed uses within this campus development to include as an accessory use both on sale and off sale alcohol. And the reason that they're approaching with us with this request is that this would allow them to avoid going through a number of special one day requests. They have been averaging anywhere from 10 to 15 of those one day requests per year. This would be limited to private party events or other fundraisers that would be conducted on the campus. And we will have a representative of Avira McKinnon here at Secker Reading to give you a little more explanation of how this would be administered. Council, any questions? Hey, man, would uh, any of the councils like to set a hearing and second reading from Monday, May 2nd, at 7 p.m. for item number 27. So moved, Erpenbach. Second, Karski. Was a motion made by Councilor Erpenbach, seconded by Councilor Karski to uh, on item number 27. Roll call vote, please. Councilor Karski? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Intamin? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. That is passed 6 to 0. Thank you. Item number 28. First reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property at 6011 and 6700 East Rice Street from the AG Agricultural District to the I-1 Light Industrial District, petition number 2011-03-03 and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. This is a petition submitted by XL Energy, the owner of this property. It's approximately 70 acres of land located out on East Rice Street. As the city has been investigating the potential relocation of the downtown switching yard out into this area, uh, we have been talking to XL Energy about potentially marketing some of their property for future industrial use. So this is the beginning of um, looking at that whole East Rice Street corridor and how it could potentially become not only a site for the new switching yard, but also for uh, a catalyst of other economic development. City Council, would anybody like to uh, set a second reading date on item number 28. So move, Anderson. Second, Entman. Councilor uh, Anderson, Jr. made a motion to set that second reading date. It was uh, seconded by Councilor Entman. A roll call vote, please. Councilor Skarski? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Entman? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. That is passed 6 to 0, item 29. First reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the Code of Ordinances of the city by adding two legal descriptions and deleting four legal descriptions to section 39-82A providing for rural service district lands. There's a provision in state law that allows the city council to designate rural service district lands and those are qualified lands that are agriculture in nature that are annexed into the city limits. And typically each year we ask the council to update the map either deleting uh, property that has been developed or adding new requests or modifying updated legal descriptions. And so this request before you is to modify four different legal descriptions of property that are currently in the city limits that would qualify as rural service district lands. And essentially they are assessed as ag land versus non-ag land as long as they remain vacant and agricultural in nature. Councilor Anderson, Jr. If I may ask one question. Mike, when I start seeing these maps of the city, again, I take a look at north of 90 and Cliff. That Dunham district up there, isn't that within the city? Yes. Okay, because the maps never are showing that. Yes, it's right there. Okay. Mike. Yep. That map shows you. That's 
Cliff Wait, Avenue. Is that, okay. I was looking at Cleveland. Nope, that's fine. My fault. Nope. Okay, thank you. Good job, Councilor Anderson. Did you? That's part of our almost 74 square miles. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The City Council, would anybody like to set a uh, date and hearing and second reading from Monday, May 2nd at 7 p.m. for item number 29? So move, Karski. Second, Aguilar. Councilor Karski has made, uh, made that motion. It was seconded by Councilor Aguilar. Could we have a vote, please? Council members Karski? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Intamin? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. That is passed 6 to 0. Thank you. Item 30. A resolution amending the 2011 2015 capital program to increase funding for CIP number 000122 Event Center in 2011. $35,000. Mr. Smith, welcome. Item 30 uh, amends the CIP and goes in tandem with item 24. So in light of the action on item 24, I would request uh, a motion be made to defer this item to uh, May 2nd. Move to defer to May 2nd, Erpenbach. Second, Aguilar. Councilor Erpenbach has made a motion to defer item number 30, uh, and it was seconded by Councilor Aguilar. Uh, is there any further discussion? One question. Yes, Councilor Rubenbach. How come there's only one of those? Isn't there a second? Uh, there's a 35,000 yep. is what number 30 is, and then... Yes, I, I can answer that question. Uh, the reason this item in this amount for the CIP is because the event center project is an item in the CIP. The other dollars will go, uh, the other 30,000 will actually uh, go to the operating budget for the community development department. Oh, okay, good. Um, Thank yeah. you for clarification. And that's also why I used $35,000 in that uh, prior slide. Correct. Uh, about. Very good. Uh, there has been a motion made to defer this item. Uh, could we have a roll call vote, please? Councilors Karski? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Intamin? Yes. Erkenbach? Yes. That is passed 6 to 0. City Council, if there's no further business, can I have a motion to adjourn? So I'll move Anderson. Sorry. Second, Intamin. And there's a motion made, and it was seconded. Uh, all those, if we could have a roll call vote, please. Councilors Karski? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Intamin? Yes. Or Mock? Yes. Thank you very much, uh, City Council. Great work tonight in the City of Sioux Falls. Uh, feel good about your City Council. Make it a great, great night.